now no it's not enough to just get an o1 petition approved now you have to go outside of the us to get it stamped if ever you want to leave the us and that's where department of state comes in and that's when you get these surprises like 221g which then hampers your employment because now you're stuck in india right like there are all these other stressors in the immigration space besides just a strong profile and like getting it approved by USCIS. So yeah, sometimes it's very confusing that, you yeah. know, if the once the USCIS has approved your O1, why does the consulate in Chennai need proof? Like uh, that something I still don't get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, but this is great. Well, to remind us again, is it EB1B or EB1A for you? It's EB1B. So I, I went through my employer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they were supportive. Yeah. Okay, so EB1B, uh, do people with a show of hands, how many people understand EB1ABC? Like with a show of hands, like everybody gets it or people don't get e e EB1ABC? Okay, let's see. Okay, so for folks who are like, okay, what is this new alphabet within this new alphanumeric code? Um, this is what EB1ABC is. Um, EB1A is extraordinary ability b1b is outstanding researcher slash professor and eb1c is the multinational corporate corporate crowd so how about uh, i know the questions that you have on you bala are the questions that folks in this call have um, asked do you have hmm. the names attached to the questions by any yeah i do so i can read the name and read yeah. the question and answer uh, the best i can yeah yeah so what i'm seeing is in, in to, to make it a touch more interactive can you call on the person whose questions are there and then they can answer or we yeah can... i hope they remember the question because I'm, yeah. I'm sure a lot of people don't you know but yeah we can try that okay yeah. uh, or should we just directly ask folks to ask you questions just to keep it interactive yeah yeah either way yeah okay. so we can we can let, let's give this a try let's maybe give give right. give a few right. a try uh, simran Prashant Bhatia, mm. are you around? Simran is not around. Uh, okay. Prashant is here. No, it's it's this it's one person. So Simran Pash Prashant Bhatia. Simran and Prashant Bhatia. <laughs> no, it's one person. So oh, the okay. yeah. Yeah. So the question is, how to build your resume, and can you share sites where I can find authentic information about EB1 visa? Uh, so this is something that. You know, Aditi and I had addressed in the poster itself. Um, you know, it's it's great to take seek help from. Uh, you know, I, I think Aditi and a few others are sharing important tips and information uh, or through LinkedIn. But I think the single source of truth is the USCIS website. And I think you know, I definitely encourage everybody. Uh, you this may come up. Uh, you know, even more. Uh, during our conversation, but I think that is the single source of truth. Uh, nobody. None of the lawyers, nobody gets to add anything more than what is out there in the USCIS. So if you have read uh, the criteria in the USCIS, that should pretty much be it. Um, what others can add is subtle nuances. So when I say subtle nuances like, hey, what are the number of citations for my area of interest? Or, you know, what does uh, outstanding work for your organization or, or critical role mean? So those details can be definitely be uh, you know sort of shared by uh, lawyers and other people but i think uscis should act as your single source of truth um, so i i hope that answers uh, the second question is hi manti chakraborty uh, if you are there i would you can ask your question i think i saw that name uh, can you hear me yeah uh, first of all, thank you very much for organizing this event and sharing the story. It's very inspiring. So I'm also a PhD student at, at a US school, and um, I think it'll take me a while to build my EB1 profile. So I was considering filing EB2 NIW first to secure a priority date because of India's great backlog, and then to continue building the EB1 profile. Um, but however, like, would you recommend applying for niw while on my f1 or f1 opt status directly like would that be okay or yeah I... I think i think if i had known i would have done uh, an niw early enough uh, you know the only side effect or the only negative of niw is the extreme cost and uh, you know a lot of phd students 
may not be able to afford it. But I think if you can afford it, if you are okay to spend that money, I think it's worth securing a priority date. So I would I would recommend it. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So uh, my only concern was that because F1 is a, a single intent and non-immigrant as uh, non-immigrant status, and then doesn't uh, matter. NW. Doesn't oh, matter. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. NIW awesome. is uh, uh, you know uh, like you you can apply for EB2 NIW sitting in India. It's national interest waiver, mm -hmm. which means that you are telling the USCIS that your contribution are going to help the US advance in be it technology, anything of that sort. So okay. I hope I'm right, Aditi. Right? Yeah, you know, all, all I will say, you know, uh, Hamanti, because and and I'm glad you brought this question up because just before Bala seminar, the previous seminar seminar was with an immigration lawyer. And anything that we say on these calls you cannot constitute this as legal advice this is not legal advice right? Right, right because for you for first of all we are not authorized right and even if you ask immigration lawyers they'll be like this is not legal advice even when they are the legal experts the <laughs> reason they say that is because it depends on a case by case basis right, right. And it's also the appetite of the lawyer who you're working with. So, for example, the person who was here previously, uh, her name is Pooja Poonam Gupta, right? She's a risk averse lawyer, right? She so it depends on the kind of lawyer you're working with. Since she's a risk averse lawyer and she doesn't want in, to get into the debacle of like F1 being non dual intent, you have to leave in like the, the US and come back to the US. Her, her, hypothesis is immigration is tough enough why would why would you want to add this on the other hand i have my own friend rahul swami who got his phd in um, i think data science from uiuc and he is currently working in walmart and he is working with a lawyer and he's filed his eb2 nw and he's going to india and his lawyer has said that okay you know what take the printout of the new f1 regulation that has come up and where it somewhere it clearly says that like f1 people can qualify for eb2 nw without breaking the non dual intent code so it depends haimanti um, but these are factors you should take into consideration when making these decisions for yourself yeah mm -hmm. and i will also add that this dual intent the word dual intent is not mentioned in anywhere in the uscis website which is which is funny and some lawyers say o1 is a dual intent visa some people say o1 is not a dual intent visa so uh, yeah and also i think lawyers are known to take a safe side but i can say for a fact that if you are on an f1 visa it does not you know not let you file for eb2 and iw and i have known many many people uh, non indians uh, you know for them it's it's not an issue right so they have filed for eb2 and iw being a phd student and the other thing you can do is you can go to victoria chen's website where, yeah and you can see that uh, they publish cases that have been approved and some of them are phd students so that should give you an idea that you can yeah. right so this is chen associates right yes it's the same one yeah they call themselves north american right, right. yeah yeah it's the same thing yeah 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 okay uh, and uh, okay thank you so much that was so helpful awesome yeah. uh, also just for just for a previous uh, like you know moving on uh, for the rest of the call if folks can keep one question per person then we'll have more ground to cover so when you're coming off you just have one question and then we can come back to you if everybody else has had a chance yeah uh, sure uh, riddhi sha riddhi sha are you on the call Okay, uh, the question is how did he build profile after PhD? I think there are similar questions, so this will get answered. Uh, so Riddhi will answer your question eventually. Uh, Dev Jyoti Bhattacharya? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, I don't exactly remember my question, but I think it was related to like industry versus academia versus national lab. Yeah, how do you see it. Yeah, I, I I have the question in front of me. So it says, how is there a required number of citations or number of papers, uh, industry versus academia, national labs after PhD? How does it look from the prospect of immigration? Um, so I got EB1B, which says outstanding researchers or professors, uh, and you know technically the the idea is that EB1B is usually for professors, but Plenty of uh, industry folks also get EB1B, so I don't think there is a there is any 
you know uh, demarcation uh, as to if you work in the industry or academia there are set crit criteria like you know if you are in the industry that particular company needs needs to employ i think more than 3 researchers full time researchers etc so as long as that is you know satisfied i think it should be okay uh, but um, but yeah i would say ask your lawyer uh, the first part of the question is what are the required number of citations um, number of papers again it's case by case basis uh, but depending on your field so this is what i have noted is that if someone is from a bio related field or pharma they tend to get a lot more citations uh, so their bar is a lot higher as compared to someone from a mechanical or civil engineering computer science if someone is in machine learning they tend to get more citations because you know that's you know that's the talk of the town right so uh, it's again case by case basis so i would recommend you talk to people who have gotten the the eb1 green card in your field and then evaluate if you would be eligible or not uh, so that's my answer yeah that answers my question thank you okay uh, ankit uh, i saw ankit but ankit hemant uh, but he doesn't have a question do you have a question to ask now uh yes i have a question uh, so uh, thank you for everything uh, thank you for giving me the information but like one thing uh, like i come from masters degree okay and then like typically i have started doing some research work and everything like writing papers like doing some peer review papers but in my case like coming from masters degree and then you are from like a phd candidate so does it have any side effect on my eb1 a because like i am going to like i have 3 years of experience and like uh, i am working as a data scientist but i just wanted to know like the citations like peer review papers do you have any count or like how how many uh, how many papers did you write and like if you have anything to discuss with it yeah so i can tell you my numbers so when my eb1 b got approved i had around 175 citations from six papers three conference three journal uh, so that was my number uh, and to 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 answer your question about phd versus masters you know a lot of masters people are getting eb1 approved uh, so i think it's all about meeting those criteria uh, masters degree is an advanced degree uh, so i think between masters and bachelors there's going to be a difference uh, like you know getting eb1 approved as a bachelors may be relatively difficult but between masters and phd i don't think there is a huge difference okay. as long as you have uh, you know enough papers citations and okay. other and, things to yeah yeah and one more thing uh, like writing medium articles or like a publishing paper publishing articles on linkedin will help the like help uh, like will be beneficial for that uh so people have said that it does benefit i personally don't think so but again that's just my personal opinion uh uh yeah because the the reason why i say this is medium articles and linkedin articles are not peer reviewed they are not reviewed by you know people who have like peer reviewers are also selected based on how good you are like how what is your qualification and and things like that so because these are not peer reviewed i would not count on them i mean but it doesn't hurt to you know add it to your petition okay i would add to that uh, ankit now that you know that the, what i have realized is as we are talking about this and in immigration some that some of the things that we take for granted that everybody knows not everybody knows um so e, for example eb1 abc we have mm -hmm. application there is also something called final merits determination in eb1 so i'll i'll put this excerpt in the chat and you will see that in eb1 when your profile gets evaluated it gets evaluated in two steps number one is do you satisfy the minimum of 3 of the 10 criteria have you provided enough evidence for that and once you have provided the evidence then there's something called totality evaluation where they will see your entire profile and then they'll evaluate well this person has given me enough reason to believe that three three sets of evidences have been checked out but when i zoom out and i look at this entire profile do i have enough reason to believe that this person is at the top of their field and when they are doing that totality evidence then these things that bala was talking about which are not peer reviewed so for example if you have a medium article and a lot of folks cite it right and it's read by 100000 people from 15 different countries then that adds right so it makes your profile look better overall 
Um, okay. But that's not going to be the basis of like somebody saying, wow, man, like Ankit is at the top of the field because he wrote five medium articles. Okay. So it depends on on how you play your cards. Okay. Uh, yes. Right. In, in a way that it may help in this way. Right. But don't don't put your eggs in that basket that um, my extraordinariness is going to hinge on me publishing non peer reviewed articles that just get a lot of social media traction. OK, sounds good. Uh, and like uh, if you can give uh, the rough idea, how many years did you take to build your profile for EV? That's the next question. So uh, we'll 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 get there. OK, sir. thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Aditi. Thank you. Bala. Yeah, uh, the next question is from Arun Kota. I hope I'm saying the name right. Uh, are you here? OK, so the question is, how long did it take you to complete the process? Uh, so for me, um, I took it a lot slower because my the OPT end was like 10 months from my last H1B attempt. So I could afford the time. I know a lot of people may not have that kind of uh, time, but uh, I took a long time to write my uh, uh, recommendation letters and uh, I, I was lucky enough to have you know multiple people agree to write me recommendation letters but writing those recommendation letter uh, took me a while I think I would say two months uh, to you know like yeah <laughs> the, the reason is because I wanted all of the recommendation letters to touch different strengths of mine and I don't want them to look similar because uh, one of the biggest difficulties that I had was that you know I could get to four recommendation letters fast but I got seven so the fifth recommendation letter was like you know what do you do do I write right everything has been covered by the rest four so that was difficult like, you know getting to the fourth and the fifth and the sixth recommendation letter was difficult uh, so that's the time that that's the thing that took me the most time um, but overall I think filing the petition you know it's going to be excerpts of what people have written about you and what you have written about yourself so that is not going to take much time uh, what is going to take a lot of time is for the uh, for the lawyer to send your profile to USCIS and I you know maybe they are overburdened or they have a lot of things on their plate but they take forever to send that package to the USCIS so I don't know if other people have similar examples to say but that's been my experience be it your yeah. own lawyer or your company's lawyer so yeah thank, thank you Bala. it was really useful uh, information just have a quick uh, question uh, while writing recommendation letters uh, like how our like achievements like some achievements can be repeatable in different uh, recommendation letters. Is it okay or how you managed your ac uh, accomplishments in different recommendation letters? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I mean, what I would say is that touch different aspects uh, because let's say you did some work which increased your increased the efficiency of some process by 20% and you were the first in the world to do it. Uh, you know touch that with different angles and when you write the recommendation letter uh, it's usually going to be you uh, you know people yes. don't have time yeah. right so yeah. when when you write it you know make sure that you are uh, you know putting yourself in the in 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 the shoes of the other person who is going to write yeah. it and be like hey why am i qualified to tell you the officer that arun's work is you know top of its field you know okay. see what i'm saying yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly. so so yeah. make sure that make sure that the uscis officer uh, gets the confidence that whoever is writing the recommendation letter is good enough or has the the authority to vouch for you so i think that's the kind of thing that you want to address okay that's that's so much useful information thank you so much Bala. and yeah. thank you aditi of course, uh, uh, Bala, can you take Anu's question? I think it's a good segue from Arun's. Sure. Uh, it's in the chat. I'll read it out to you. Where yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I saw it. Yeah. Where all the recommendation letters from professors and from your work leadership? Uh, okay. Uh, good question. I would recommend that you get, you do not get uh, recommendation letters from the work leadership. And here is why. Because when work leadership gives you a recommendation letter, there is an incentive for you getting the green card that is beneficial for them, right? 
so you should for the most part i mean it doesn't hurt if you don't have anybody to go to definitely get it from your work uh, leadership but preferably get it from people who have cited your work and who have benefited from your work that is when you get the max uh, i would say you know brownie points from the uscis officer um, because for them they are going to vouch for you without any benefit because you know you getting a green card is not going to benefit them so that's my recommendation and for me i got it mostly from professors uh, i got it from uh, you know i got funded by the air force research labs um, so you know one of the heads of one of the labs in the air force research labs gave me a recommendation letter as well but yeah mostly it, it was professors who have cited my work and i could you know ask them be like hey you know you have cited my work uh, can you write or is it okay if you send me a recommendation letter about how it benefited your work so that's probably the best way to go okay uh, the next question is monaza uh, shahab yeah yeah one question here uh, in this point so you were saying that uh, you got it from your professors right so for example if someone is not coming from research background right mm -hmm. like and who doesn't have the dissertation route right he's right. more on the credit route right mm -hmm. so how you get those letters from your professors right like you just need some class some programs like three or four credits for that class right and it has been a while so in that scenario how many letters are necessary and what kind of professors you should approach right they might not remember you also right you graduated seven years ago so how you deal in that those scenarios yeah well uh, th that is going to be difficult to reach out to professors who have taught you and who, if they have just taught courses then you know their recommendation letter is not going to be of much value in the sense that they have not used your work uh, in this case what you can do is you can uh, reach out to researchers in your company who have benefited from your work uh, and they can vouch for the kind of work that you have done you know maybe uh, give the recommendation letter in such a way that you know it does not have any confidential information but at the same time if you can find people in your company that have authored papers because papers are in the public domain right that can be said as hey you know this is the work you know look at it uh, which have benefited from what you have done inside the company uh, should be okay I, I think that's that's a better route to go than professors and, and yeah. also like suppose like in whichever field you are working right so suppose if you have paper and mm -hmm. that is a different domain right so if there are outsider people right so can we get it if they have cited our work can we get the letters from them as well if necessary yeah yeah, yeah. that's the best way to go i think uh, people who have cited your work is the best way to go because in the letter itself they can write that hey i have cited this person's work in this paper so nothing more uh, validating right than that that you know someone has cited your work means they have used it in some form or the other okay and, and is there any particular template that we have to write in the recommendation letter or just uh, at, at, at a vague that you have worked we have cited this, your work of this paper and this is the topic right that's all or is there a specific no, no, this, template there you is, need to write? well there is a template that i followed and i think it's quite common to follow that template so i can roughly tell you what the template looks like so the beginning of the uh, of the recommendation letter talks about the recommender himself or herself. So they tell about, you know, hey, I am the professor of this institute. I have had 25 years of experience. This is what my Google Scholar reads. I am the head of blah, blah, blah. Hence, I am eligible to talk about uh, this person's work. And then they talk about how they know you. Like, you know though i don't know this person personally i have come across his work in this 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 paper uh, you know uh, journal or or conference and i found it useful they were the first pe person to do this and i found it useful in my research and this is how i found it useful in my research and then conclude the recommendation letter by saying that you know uh, this work is extremely useful and it will be used for you know uh, whoever take wants to take this work forward hence i recommend this person for permanent residency so that that's roughly the format thank you and is there a number of recommendation that we need or it, like for any criteria that they uh, are used for eb1a I, 
I mean, the the more the better. Uh, but I would say somewhere between four and five should should be okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Monaza Shahab, are you here? Uh, I think uh, it, it's a question uh, related to one of the previous questions. Uh, it says, "Is NIW worth?" Uh, I think it's definitely worth. I think the only downside is the cost, and but if you can afford it, uh, it's well worth locking an early priority date. So yeah, uh, Rahul Jain, what criteria you focused on? How did you use research done for your work as an evidence? Um, well, I went for. I mean, I think this is what most people go for: is um, authorship of scientific. Well, I don't know the exact word, so apologize if you, uh, if I'm mixing it if I'm mixing it up. But it's usually um, you know scientific authorship, uh, you know judging the work of others, um, critical media articles about your work, um, and uh, I think critical work at an organization. So that's those are the criteria criteria that I went for. Uh, Twisha Chatterjee. Um, if you're around, okay. Um, how did you find legal help regarding the this visa? Is this only reserved for the best of the best, or can you actually work your way through? Um, I'll start from the last part of the sentence. I think you can definitely work your way through, and there are enough examples. You know, on LinkedIn, you know, you search for it, you find it. There are so many examples of people who have really worked their way through. Um, it is reserved for the best of the best. I personally don't think I'm the best of the best. Uh, I, I mean, how do you even define the best of the best, right? Like, is it the top one percent? Is it the top point one percent? But I think, uh, you know, if you have enough uh, enough to prove those points right it's all about satisfying those seven eight points that are mentioned in the uscis website so find out what people have done uh, and what you can do to get better uh, be it researching be it collaborating with other researchers uh, you know a lot of the times you you sometimes forget what you have already done you know you might have done worked on a you know a car project or you might have done some capstone uh, project or you might have contributed to open source you know there are some real opportunities to be exploited there so you can actually make something meaningful out of it you can define a problem statement yourself and you know the world is not limited you can definitely find collaborators and that's the power of the internet right i would say use the power of the internet to find collaborators and you know produce good volume work and you know it will eventually get cited because people are looking for it and if something is going to benefit them people are going to cite it and that's eventually going to improve your um, uh, chances uh, how did you find legal help regarding this visa so i went through my company so my company lawyer benef uh, you know were the one who filed it uh, but if you want to seek an independent lawyer, I think there are so many. Uh, I think Victoria Chen comes to mind, but Aditi, if you want to add other lawyers, yeah, feel free. Uh, there, I, I did. Uh, yeah. Whenever you signed up for this event, you got a link to a Slack community. I would encourage you to join that Slack community. And we are always, people are always sharing their hot takes on like which lawyers are good, um, which lawyers are. Uh, you know, you should stay away from. <laughs> um, so all all of those things are, are included in the in the Slack. I don't even know if you're mean. Oh, okay, all right, cool. Um, I know Stephen and Psychoshit's hands have been like doing this for a while. <laughs> so do you want to take those questions? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Stephen, do you want to go for it? Hi, Aditi and Bala. Sorry, I didn't want to just hop on. Uh, I have a quick question. I am on the verge of planning on my O1A. Is it okay if I also simultaneously work and submit my EB1A? Yeah. Or is that, a, no. is that a problem? Like imagine in two months from now, I submit my EB1A and then after, two after four months, I submit my O1A. Is that a problem? Is it okay? 
I just wanted to check with you guys about that. I mean, you can submit an O1A. Uh, once you get it approved, you can submit a DB1, but it doesn't hurt to submit it simultaneously. But again, check with your lawyer. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, but I don't see a problem. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. That was my question. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. The only thing is, like, your things get murky when you have to like leave the US and come back. That when the Department of State gets involved, okay, then it becomes a little weird. So. Okay. Yeah. Like Bala said, just check with your check with the lawyer. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. But thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, hey, Aditi. Hey, Bala. Thanks for organizing this thing. My question is, uh, I'm on. I already have an EB2 visa through my H1B uh, with my employer. Does moving on to having a NIW improve my chances later for filing an EB1B? Uh, first question. Second thing was, uh, I want to understand. Like how does USCIS evaluate membership of professional organizations? And if you have any examples of your, uh, yeah, from your uh, a journey, can you tell them? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'll take the first question. Sorry, the second part of the question, which is membership. Uh, and and I think it's a it's a nice place to address it as well. So membership means that you have to be invited to be a member uh, and. Uh, you know, getting like an IEEE membership, uh, you know, anybody can get an IEEE membership, right? A SAE membership, you can pay money for a year. Uh, even AIAA membership, you can pay and get it. So that's not what they're looking for. Uh, again, you know, this can help in the whole final merits thing. You know, every little things will add up. But uh, for, for my case, I was a uh, sub editor uh, and an associate editor for two journals. Uh, so uh, I don't know if it helped, but we did, you know, we did put it as the part of our petition. But uh, when you look at membership, they want the journal or a conference to invite you and be like, hey, would you want to co-chair this session or would you want to speak at an event? So that's the kind of membership that they, they are talking about. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. And the first part of the question is, uh, EB2 versus EB2 NIW. Well, it's not going to increase the pace of when you get your green card because it's the same. Uh, could you turn on the turn down the speaker? Psycho I think I'm getting. Okay, uh, so that's not going to increase the pace. And uh, I think what you meant was, if I get an EB2 NIW, is it going to be better for my EB1? Um, I think the bar for EB2 and EB1 are significantly different. Um, so I don't think getting an EB2 NIW would automatically mean or increase your chances of an EB1. Um, yeah, that's my take. Uh, but, you know, again, you know, we should also understand that USCIS officers are also people. So it may work on their psyche a little bit that, hey, this person has got an EB2 NIW you know, might as well. So that's, but again, this is not a concrete enough thing that yes, it will work. Like we don't have enough evidence, at least I don't. So uh, yeah, that's there that. Was, there was a regulation very recently. Uh, I'm just looking through my email. Um, did you know, by the way, you can like sign up for USCIS updates. It's, it's a little bit traumatizing to see USCIS in your mailbox, not going to lie. But if you <laughs> have like, if you are like what Bala said that USCIS is a single source of truth, you can go to their website and you can sign up for their, uh, like, you know, getting regular updates. So one of the updates, it was not related to EB2 and IW, but like, what are the chances of you getting an EB1 if your O1 is approved? So there was a regulation and don't quote me on that. I, I'll put those two links over here because this, this could be relevant. That when your EB1 petition is reviewed, then if you have shown that your O1 is, and I'm paraphrasing, if you have satisfied O1, because there is such a significant overlap between the criteria of EB1 and O1, it is a good indicator, but not, it is it is not the thing that's going to get you improved, like, you know, uh, improve, uh, like get you approved. It's kind yeah. of like getting 95% in your 12th boards and then going for your IIT. Like, does that guarantee you're going to go to IIT? No, but does that guarantee that you're a smart person? Yes. So gives you face validity is, is all there is. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's a good point. Uh, and the reason why I said EB2 NIW will not uh, with EB1 is that significant overlap doesn't exist as much. So that, that was my point, yeah. 
Uh, okay, so the next question, Shraddha. Uh, how can research scientists outside of academia keep publishing articles having signed NDAs in private companies? Um, again, good question. Uh, the, you know, one of the things that you can do is, uh, you know, if you have found some, or if you have researched on some novel algorithm, you can always work on, you know, uh, a generic data set. Uh, you know, you can f always find generic ways of publishing the paper or even uh, publishing your open source code uh, or, or on GitHub. So that's one way to do it. Um, so, you know, I can I can talk about Amazon. I mean, people here publish a lot, uh, especially applied scientists. So, uh, but yeah, definitely talk to your employer and be like, you know, hey, I'm not going to use your data. And is it okay to use some other data set uh, and and publish this? So I think that's one way to go. Hope that answers. Uh, next question is Deepal Vora, F1 student. Sorry, F1 visa is a single intent visa. Do you think one on F1 visa should not travel to India? Again, that's sorry. It's a it's a lawyer question. I I don't think I I, I know the answer to that. So the question is, do you think one on F1 visa should not travel to India after applying for EB1 AB from US? Uh, yeah, not sure. I can I can ask you to talk to this guy. His name is Denny Alapattu. He was a postdoc who came to the US on a J1 visa. And then it was a really sad story. Uh, his his dad passed away, so he had to go back to India to do his final rites and final rituals. And at that time, unbeknownst to Denny, and this is where you know the variability of the counsel that you receive from lawyers, even he had already applied for his EB1. So when he went to the counselor to get his J1 stamped, the count the the US or like visa officer said, well. You are on a J1, which is a non-immigrant visa, but I already see you apply for your EB1, which means that you're showing immigrant intent on a non-immigrant visa. So his F1 J J1 got rejected, uh, and then his uh, boss in uh, in his lab over here had to then send an email to this consulate or whatever, and then had his J1 was approved. So like, imagine the headspace of this person who had lost his father, who's lost a job. Yeah has a whole family and then he is does he have to like you know wrap up his apartment here and then like move back or is there some hope it's very it's it's very tough so um always check with a lawyer and when you check with a lawyer check with another lawyer yes yeah. <laughs> so, just i don't know bala i i i hope that is what your experience was it's like you know, yeah yeah absolutely i mean the the whole owen thing right i checked with multiple lawyers and they said you know, you should be able to get it. So yeah, that doesn't hurt to get a second opinion or third even. A quick time check for you, Bala. I know you have time till 1 p.m. Um, so yeah, you... I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so Ophelia, no question. Eben is sorry. Um, Man Manila. Uh, the question is, how many citations does it require for EB1? Again, case by case basis. You know, check with people. With similar background, similar field of research interests who have gotten it. I think that's the only way to go, unfortunately. Uh, Leah, uh, the question is, what is the process? What program is qualified? Do I need a legal representative? Uh, you know, I would say, you know, check out one of maybe Aditi's uh, uh, podcasts or events regarding this or just check out USCIS website on what the process is. Um, it's I think I think out of scope for this call, right? Uh, yeah. Lekhya Ravi, what resources do you recommend for someone currently doing research and plan to get GC in this path? Uh, resources. Uh, I don't I don't know Lekhya if you're here, but when you say resources, do you mean uh, law related resources or? I'm just going to wait for a bit if Lekhya is here. But uh, yeah, uh, I don't know what resources they are. Uh, they they want to be looked at, but I think 
I think what they mean is law related resource. Uh, so I would say follow Aditi on twi uh, Twitter, uh, sorry, uh, LinkedIn, um, uh, and and definitely visit USCIS website or uh, We Greened. Uh, they put a lot of resources and that should give you and get you an idea. There are also plenty of uh, immigration related podcasts. Uh, I know Soundarya is doing one. Uh, so they talk to people with similar experiences. So I think if you cover all these three, you should get a fair, fair idea. Uh, Ami uh, would like to hear about track it and approval trends. Uh, not sure how to answer that question. Uh, approval trends, I think USAS publishes approval rates, so that should give you a fair idea of um, Anirudh Nanda Kumar, I see the hands getting raised, so do you have a question? We can take it live. Hi, um, thank you for your time. I'm, I'm, I'm just curious to know that I've seen for when you apply for EB1, B, um, does your job have to be strictly related to your field of research because I've seen a lot of PhDs transition into consulting at McKinsey or Bain and all and they say that their work is relevant but I'm just curious to know. Uh, I would say if it's relevant it's better because otherwise how are you going to substantiate right I mean um, you know if you got a PhD in management and then you work as a consultant yes that makes sense but if you got a PhD in physics then you work at McKinsey and you want to apply for EB1B. You can still apply for EB1A because then you can bank on your physics related credentials. But if you are working for EB1B, uh, if you are work, uh, filing through an employer, then it gets a little difficult. Uh, are you trying to do something similar? I just want to address it by use case. Uh, no, I mean, I'm just considering options. I'm still a PhD student, but I'm just, okay. I was just uh, looking at LinkedIn and considering. Right. I mean, uh, uh, if it has like 60% overlap, I, I think it should be fine. But if it's, you know, diametrically opposite, I wouldn't. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Right. right. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, Ade Dolapo. Ade uh, the question is, would 80 citations be good enough for EB1? How many paper reviewing do, do you have to get done? Would it be possible to get approved with four papers and 80 citations? Um, I would say above 100 is a, like a psychological number, but for your stream of research, I would say consult with a lawyer. Um, so yeah. Sai Nikhil Reddy, is research in masters useful in building? Yes, EB1 profile, yes, uh, any research, you know. You could do independent research. You could contribute to open source. All of that is going to help. Uh, best ways to improve EB1 file profile without PhD. Uh, I, I think I partly answered this question is to, you know, think about what you have done in the past. How can you add additional layers? You know, probably contribute to open source. Find some collaborators online. Uh, so that's the way to work through this. Sahil Fazal. What all things can grad students do to build? Yeah, again, similar question, so I'm going to skip it. Uh, Amrita, can someone file? Can, when can someone file for an EB1? Does their employer need to file for it? So, like Aditi mentioned initially, there are two different kinds of EB1s. One is EB1A, the other is EB1B. EB1B uh, needs to be filed by the employer. EB1A needs to be self petitioned. Uh, the only difference is probably EB1B has a slightly lower bar than EB1A and EB1A because it's self petitioned, uh, you know, you have to uh, do the financial side of it. Uh, Sahil Fazal, I think is another, I, I think it's the same question. Advet ba Balaji, how many citations are needed again, case by case? How many of the 10 categories are recommended? Well, they say that uh, you have to satisfy at least two in case of EB1B uh, and three in case of EB1A. But the more the better, uh, because in case you fall weak on one of the categories, you, you know, it helps to have some other category sort of, you know, uh, push you up. Uh, Stephen Samuel, uh, 
EB1A, EB1 NIW, do I need to go through a lawyer? Uh, well, technically, you can file on your own, by the way. You know, whenever I say lawyer, uh, don't think that, you know, you only have to go through a lawyer. You can technically file it on your own, but it's an enormous amount of work and we don't do it on a day to day basis. Right. So that's one of the reasons why people go through a lawyer. Uh, but yeah, it's it's better to go through a lawyer. Uh, how much does a PhD in STEM help? Uh, how many research papers again case by case, case basis uh, Someone called Jay uh, as a PhD student. How can I fasten my process of EB1? Uh, well, well, the only way you can make it fast is by applying for premium processing. I don't think there is any other You know bottleneck or any other knobs that you can tune to make it fast uh, Aditi, right, right. I mean, I, I can't think of anything else other than the premium processing part. Uh, for uh, expediting what? EB1. So the question is, as a PhD student, how can I fasten my process of EB1? Okay, listen. The the question should be, should I be? <laughs> the the thing is, the the one thing that you will hear uh, immigration lawyers, especially there is one uh, video that we I, that uh, I had posted on LinkedIn where. Immigration lawyer Samir Khedkar said that you have to play the long game while making sure that your short term goals are satisfied. So if you are a PhD student, the priority should be do you have a plan to. To safeguard your legal status in the short term, because right now, even if you qualify for EB1, right, there is a backlog and for the backlog to clear, it's going to take some time. And you may not have that green card in hand by the time you graduate. So if you're putting all the eggs in one basket, then that puts you at a very precarious position. And if you are, that's just on one side. On the other side is if you have to go home for some reason or the other, and you've applied for your EB1, and then at the port of entry, like I said, if an immigration lawyer, if an immigration officer tells you that, why have you applied for your EB1 when you're in a non-immigrant visa, now you're in, now you're in deep trouble, right? So like the goal is not always expedite fast. Bottom line is immigration is slow. It's slow. Whatever thing you think is going to happen, add five years more. That's 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 my take on it. But I know that there are folks uh, in the queue. Let's put a hard stop at 115. How about that? Mm, yeah? yeah, sure, sure, yeah. So let's take the last three questions with from Appy, Ash, and Pallav. But thank you. First of all, you're going to get an email uh, from Topmate. Please say thank you to Bala. He took so much time from his day. Uh, and it was pretty much like a short, like last minute thing. I was like, Bala, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. this uh, seminar for us. So please take some time to thank Bala uh, in, in the testimonial section or put like, you know, a, a thank you over here. Uh, I, I really appreciate Bala sharing his counsel with us, and it would be wonderful to hear it from you as well. All right. Cool. Uh, yeah, the final questions are uh, sorry. Uh, uh, this, okay, Ash, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, you mentioned about uh, con uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, you mentioned about contributions to the open source, right? How do we substantiate such a contribution to open source when there are multiple people involved in that? Uh, so, okay, so I think I, I should modify my answer. So what I mean by that is, you know, when you contribute to open source, you know, try to make uh, make it a research article, right? You can always document what I got, what you contributed to the open source and, uh, you know, write an article or submit a paper out of it. And uh, to answer your question about uh, how do you substantiate it, you know, if you are co-author of a peer-reviewed journal, I think that's proof enough, right? Uh, okay. Uh, I thought it, you meant the GitHub open source projects. Uh, isn't that what you meant? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I meant that, which is why I modified it. So, so okay, okay. Uh, just yeah. cont mere contribution is not uh, enough because, you know, uh, you know, what are you going to send uh, to the USAS, right? Are you going to send your commit history? No, right? Uh, so, I think I think it's it's important to document it or you know make something out of it uh, as a as a paper or or something of that sort is what I meant. Yeah, got got it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Appy. 
Hi, Bala. Thank you so much for this great informational session. Um, I have a question about my potential career path after my PhD. I just finished in a, a sort of a biomedical engineering space. And I want to know, like I got a, a number of papers that are in the process of being pu published. And um, I ideally don't want to work in R&D anymore. Uh, I'm looking into field application scientists and application scientist type roles that have, you know, it's applied science, but not direct like producing science. Do you think I would still be able to pursue an EB related or O1 related path if I were to go down this career route? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, okay. uh, like I mentioned, I think this was uh, Something similar to a previous question. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think I, I, Anirudh yeah. had had the question. So yeah, I would say something like you know 60 60 percent overlap should be fine. I mean, okay. uh, as long as you don't go into a sales role or a marketing role, you know, then yeah, yeah that's that's my opinion. Okay, okay, that really helps. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, I think Pallav had a question, and then we can wind up. Yeah, hi, this question for Aditi. So like for regarding the recommendation letters, right? So if we do you have any like uh, like different research, like, you know, like uh, researchers or their professors and their contact numbers, right? We can we can ask them for right in the future, like when you are coming near to your preparation, right? Filing. So if we want some pool of the people, right? We, we need some recommendation in particularly healthcare field or, you know, pharmaceutical or biopharmaceutics right so so do you have any list of those things that we can like maybe you know from your research or your in the past right like so you can recommend them or we have to get it only through the online or you know through uh through like different ways other ways right like participating in events and all those things you know what i'm saying so what, what you're saying is, is there a list of folks who are experts in your field? Correct. There is an Excel sheet and like you can just reach out to these people. Yes, yes, yes. So let me let me use this as an opportunity to clarify uh, what is the requirement of a letter of recommendation. So like Bala was saying, if you go to a USCIS website, especially the USCIS page for EB1, you're not going to see letters of recommendations there. Right. So then it begs the question, well, I mean, it doesn't even show it as a criteria. Why the heck do I need it? The reason for letters of recommendation is to provide that qualitative evidence for the quantitative work that you're showing. So, for example, if you say that you have built a product uh, or you have you have patented an idea and that idea has been adopted by some other company, which has then produced them millions of dollars, you want somebody from that company to provide that letter of evidence for you. So when you're thinking about letter of recommendation, the mindset that we have often have for letters of recommendation is graduate school mindset. That who is that professor who I can reach out to who can say, oh my gosh, Bala is so great, please take him to Virginia Tech. That is not going to be the purpose of this letter of recommendation. This letter of recommendation is a qualitative mm -hmm. evidence to the impact that you have created in the field. And the person who can vouch for that is somebody who has benefited from the impact, benefited from the product that you have created, which has then impacted them in a positive way. So, no, no, I yeah. got it. Yeah, I got it. But yeah. my question was like, suppose if you have the database data, right? Like for a healthcare, you have like, you know, this candidate or this previously, right? They got EB1 approved, right? Or something in the healthcare field, right? And you, have, you still have the list of those people, then we can reach out with them. Like, this is our work. Can you look into that? And, you know, if they like, then what we can say them that can you write a recommendation letter for us? That, like that. I'm saying that that letter of recommend you can get it written and you can feel really good about yourself right like oh yeah i got a letter of recommendation but will that move the needle in your case then uscis officer is going to come back and say well are you just currying favor from this person because this person has not benefited from the work you mean you see what i'm saying no but they're still they're citing your work right we will tell them these are the papers yeah. and they liked it and then they they are giving the letters right something like that then you have to find those people who have cited your work how can they be in a generic database you see where i'm going with okay this? okay yeah yeah okay yeah. so it's it's your contact right it's somebody who has benefited from your work bala is it is it what yeah i i i completely agree and i think um, you know different like i reached out to multiple people a lot of them denied uh so so you know we we also have to respect their time you know i think professors have uh, an extremely hard time uh, navigating through 
so many things that that are on their plate you know from reviewing papers to being on a chair of a journal so i think we each one of us needs to understand who are the best people and when there is the internet i think we should not look into databases because you know m maybe doing some work on our own end can give us way more benefit than looking into a generic database no, because so, why i ask this question because we are in the industry right and these are academia things right so i we thought like you know like some recommendation might helpful yeah that, so so it, 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 that, 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 yeah that's industry. exactly the that's exactly the point so if you are in the industry and if you get a recommendation letter uh from a person in the academia let's say from the healthcare industry from a generic database my point is that it is going to be only a recommendation letter it's not going to be a helpful recommendation letter so okay. that's that's my point okay okay thank you for your benefit parlor and for everybody who has hung tight till the end of the call i have uh, copied the link to the uh, to karthik krishnamurthy's presentation he is a hardcore like industry fellow who got his ev1 first he got rejected then he got approved again look at who look at the kind of people who he asked for letters it will give you an idea of who qualifies it's not just getting that letter and checking off that box you are creating a legal case for yourself that you're extraordinary so this should be evidence right it's not just a box to check so that's what bala is even driving at that like it has to be somebody who can who who's an expert and who can attest to the benefit that they have accrued from the work that you have done yeah exactly thank you thank you, thank you Chris. Awesome. All right. Um, Bala, any parting thoughts? No, all the best um, for anyone who is pursuing their EB1 journey. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much awesome. it. Awesome. Awesome. And I will send you this recording and I will send you Bala's uh, podcast. He has interviewed some like really cool people. I would encourage you to listen to that. And uh, I think one of the benefits of getting this green card is to get to pursue the things that you really like doing as well. So and Bala is a great example for that. So Bala, thank you again for being with us today. Yeah. And thank you for for investing one hour, 15 minutes of your day figuring out. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, it, it's good to talk to people and you know, you also, get to think uh, because from the questions you you get to realize what what boats people are on and you know what what they are thinking so it was it was a lot of fun so thank you so much yeah awesome awesome thank you so much bala take care everybody thank you bye 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 bye, -bye.